Hello everyone, Kevin here, and this is part 5b in my modding Minecraft 1.8 series. In the previous video, we added the Ninja Star projectile, uh, the banana and banana smoothie items for the monkey. In this video, we'll be adding the tameable Ninja Monkey mob. So let's get started. We start off with the Entity Monkey class. Right click on the Entity Passive folder and create a new class. Call it Entity Monkey and click Finish to create. We start by adding the imports we'll need. This Entity Monkey AI Range Attack class doesn't exist yet, but we'll create it later. We extend this class from the Entity Tameable class and implement the iRange attack mob class, which contains a function to perform ranged attacks. We declare a particle counter integer and a constructor. In the constructor, first we call the parent constructor, then we set a bounding box size for the monkey. This obfuscated function should be called avoid water. It sets a flag in the ground navigator to avoid wandering into water. If this is set to true, the entity will not navigate into water on its own, unless pushed or tempted by the player. However, when the entity gets tamed, this setting is overridden by the follow owner AI, and the pet will follow the player into water. Next we have a list of AI tasks. A swimming task for when the monkey falls into water. A sit AI for when the player tells the monkey to sit. A uh, follow owner AI for when the monkey is tamed. Uh, the parameters for the follow owner AI is the movement speed and the minimum and maximum follow distance. Then we have the entity monkey AI range attack, which doesn't exist yet. We'll code this class later. The parameters will be the movement speed, the attack rate, the minimum attack distance, and maximum attack distance. Then attempt AI, so the monkey will follow the player when holding a banana. The parameters for the tempt AI are the movement speed, the item that tempts the monkey, and a boolean that sets whether the entity is scared by the player's movements. Then there's a mating AI, a wander AI, a watch closest AI, and a look idle AI which are all common ground-based passive mob AIs. Note that the follow owner and range attack AI have the same task numbers, and the watch closest and look idle AI both have the same task numbers as well. This ensures that these tasks can't run at the same time. The three target tasks at the bottom are special AI tasks that set the monkey's attack targets. The owner hurt by target will set the monkey's attack target to the entity that attacks his owner. The owner hurt target task will set the attack target to any entity that the owner attacks. And the hurt by target task will set the attack target to any entity that attacks the monkey.
Finally, we initialize the particle counter to zero. These are two helper functions to set and get the monkey's color. The clothing color is stored in element 18 of the monkey's data watcher. I'll explain what the data watcher is in just a moment. Next is the entity init function. We call the parent init function. Then here we select a random color from the enum die color enumerator and assign it to rand color. Then we add a new object element to the monkey's data watcher and set it to the random color. Then we call the set die color function we created above and pass it the same color index value so the color instantly becomes live. So what is the data watcher? Well, it's a dynamic array that every entity has. It holds all the entity's instance-specific data. Each class in the entity hierarchy contributes to the data watcher. Here's a table of all the elements in the data watcher from the entity class to the entity tameable class. As you can see, all tameable extended entities inherit 17 elements from their parent classes. So we can add new elements to the data watcher starting at element 18, to which we assign the monkey's clothing color. Next, we need two functions for getting and setting the angry flag in the data watcher. When he gets angry, we set the is immune to fire to true. Because when he gets angry, we would like him to burst into flames and start throwing fire imbued ninja stars. This update AI task event function is used to update any AI tasks that are currently running. If there is no current attack target, we set the angry flag to false. And else if there is an attack target and the monkey is tamed and his health is less than 25, he becomes angry. The can despawn function is inherited from the entity living class and returns whether this entity can be despawned. We set it to return true if the entity is not tamed and at least 2400 ticks has passed since he spawned. The apply entity attributes function is where we set attributes for this entity, such as max health, movement speed, attack damage, knockback resistance, and follow range. Most of these attributes will be hard coded into our custom AI and monkey classes. So the only ones we need here are the movement speed and the max health. We call the parent apply entity attributes, then if the monkey is tamed, we set the max health to 100, otherwise we set it to 20. The last statement sets the base movement speed to a standard value used by most entities. The set tamed event function is called when you make an attempt to tame a monkey by clicking on it with a banana. We override the set tamed function and call the parent set tamed function. The success parameter will contain whether the taming attempt was successful. If so, we set the max health to 100, 
otherwise we set it to 20. The parent set tamed function will set the monkey to tamed if the attempt was successful. The fall event function is called when an entity falls and hits the ground. The parameters will contain the distance from which the entity fell and the damage multiplier for that distance. This is where we would normally calculate and remove health after a fall. However, I don't want the monkey to take fall damage, so I override this function and leave it blank. These two functions are the load and save event functions. We need to call the parents in both of them to save all the inherited data for this entity. Then we can save and load the data, which is specific to this monkey. These statements save and load the angry flag under the key name angry. Here we save the current die color as a byte value under the key name clothes color. To load the clothes color data, we first need to check if the clothes color data exists in the saved file. We use the has key function to check if the clothes color key exists. The parameters for the has key function are the name of the key, and an integer that defines the type of value. 99 is the type for numerical keys. If the close color tag is found, we can then use the set die color function we created to assign the stored color to the monkey. These four functions set the entity's sounds, the living sound, the hurt sound, the death sound, and the volume setting. The getDropItem function returns which item drops when the monkey dies. If you want your monkey to drop any specific items, I covered how to do that in the turtle mob tutorials. So I won't repeat it here. For now, we set this to return nothing by using the getItemById function and passing negative 1 to return a null item. OnLivingUpdate is an event function called each tick as long as the entity is alive. We call the parent on living entity function to start. Then we call the update arm swing progress function, which updates the arm swing animation. Then we check if the attack target is null, and if the monkey is angry. If the attack target is null, the monkey should not be in angry mode, so we set angry to false. This function will play a particle effect when called. The parameters are the particle type to use, the amount of particles to spawn, and the amount of random jitter for each particle. The bottom line is too long to fit on screen, so I put it in the box below. We create a getTailRotation function to return the current rotation of the monkey's tail based on his health. 
We'll call this function in the render class to set the rotation of the tail before rendering. If the monkey is tamed, we multiply the health by 1% of the total tail rotation. If the monkey is not tamed, the tail is always up at the total rotation value, which is 1.52432. This is another custom function. Teleport near player will select a random ground block near the player and teleport the monkey to that location. The function will spawn various cloud and smoke particles before and after teleporting the monkey. The onUpdate function is called every tick. First, we call the parent onUpdate. Here, we check if the monkey is not in battle and if his health is less than 100. If so, we heal for 0 0.01. This will make the monkey slowly heal on its own when he's not being attacked or attacking. If the monkey is tamed, we continue through this block. We check if the monkey is angry. If so, we create random fire and smoke particles and play the fire sound. This is where we use the particle counter as a timer to spawn particles every 10 ticks. Then we get the owner of the monkey and check if the monkey is sitting. If not, we get the current distance between the owner and the monkey. If the distance is more than 150 units, we teleport the monkey to the player using the teleport near player function we created earlier. This function simply returns the monkey's eye height. The attack entity from function is called when the monkey is attacked by another entity. This obfuscated function returns whether the source of the attack is the player or a source that is not a targetable entity. If so, we return false, otherwise, we set sitting to false in case the monkey was sitting and call the parent attack entity from, which will process the attack accordingly. This is breeding item just returns whether the item is a breeding item. We return true if the item stack is a banana smoothie. The get max spawn and chunk function returns how many monkeys can be allowed to spawn in a single chunk. The can mate with function will return whether the monkey can mate with the specified entity. If the specified entity is tamed, null, or is not a monkey, we return false. If the entity is a monkey and is tamed and is in love, we return true. This function creates and spawns a new child monkey into the world with the same owner ID as the parents. This obfuscated function is called from the attack tasks, and it returns whether the specified attack target is a valid target. We set it to return false for all tamed entities, creepers, and players. The second return line is displayed in the box below.
The attack entity with ranged attack function is inherited from the I ranged attack mob and is called when the monkey attacks a target. First, we create a new entity ninja star named star. Then we get the distance between the star and the target in order to calculate the heading. We call the swing item function, which starts the arm swinging animation. And we use the direction and horizontal distance values to set the star's heading. Here we play the bow sound effect. If the monkey is angry, we set the ninja star's on fire variable to true. Finally, we spawn the star into the world. The last function is the interact function. The interact function is called when the player interacts with a monkey by clicking on it with the right mouse button. This first line gets a reference to the item that the player is currently holding in his hand and stores it in the item stack variable. Then we create a conditional statement. If the monkey is tamed and the player clicking on him is the owner, execute this block. Else, if the monkey is not tamed and the item stack is a banana and the distance to the player is less than 9 units and the monkey is not angry, execute this block. This obfuscated function returns whether the player is the owner of the monkey. We'll start with the first block. For if the monkey is tamed and the player clicking on him is his owner. First we check if the item stack is not null. And another conditional statement to check if the item the player is holding is an instance of food. If so, we cast the item stack object to item food type and store it in an item food object called food item. Another conditional statement checks if the food item is a banana and the monkey's health is less than 100. If so, the monkey is a tamed monkey, and the player clicking on him with a banana is his owner, and the monkey's health is below 100. So this interaction should heal the monkey. So if the game is not in creative mode, we remove a banana from the stack that the player is holding. Then we call the heal function and pass 10 as the heal amount. And call the play particle effect function and spawn the village happy particle effect, which is a green shimmer around the monkey. Also, when we remove an item from a stack, we need to check if the item stack is empty. If so, we need to set that inventory slot to a null item stack object. Then we return true to complete the interaction. The else if statement checks if the item is a die. If so, this block gets the color of the die object and sets the monkey's die color using the set die color function. Finally, this statement checks if the player is the owner of the monkey and the item is not a breeding item. If so, the only other option here is to make the monkey sit or stand.
This line sets his sitting flag to the opposite of his current state. Then his jumping state is set to false, his navigation path is cleared, and his attack target is set to null. Now let's do the else if block for if the monkey is not tamed and the item stack is a banana. This block is obviously for taming the monkey. So the first thing we do is remove a banana from the stack then set the slot to a null item object if the stack is empty. Then we get a random integer between 0 and 3, and if the random integer is a 0, we tame the monkey using the setTamed function. Then we clear the monkey's navigation path and attack targets and set his state to sitting. We set his health to 100 and assign the player's unique ID as his owner using this obfuscated function. We call the play tame effect passing true as the parameter, which spawns the heart particle effect. Finally, we call the set entity state from the world object and assign 7 to this entity which sets a flag used in the Entity Tracker system. In the else block here, the taming attempt failed, so we call the play tame effect and pass false as the parameter, which spawns the black smoke particle effect, and we set the entity state to 6. And we're all done with the monkey entity class. You can save and close. The next class we're going to work on is that custom attack AI script. Right click on the entity AI folder and create a new class. Call this class Entity Monkey AI Range Attack and click Finish to create. We extend this class from the Entity AI Base class. and we add all the imports we'll need. Then we declare the variables we'll need. Attacker will contain a reference to the monkey using this AI, and ranged attack entity will contain a reference to the same object but cast to the I ranged attack mob object. Attack target contains the current target that the monkey is attacking, and counter will be used for timing the ninja star attacks. Then we create the constructor and initialize all the variables. We set the mutex for this AI class to 3. I covered AI classes in my turtle tutorials. 
so I won't go into a lot of detail on the functions here. But the should execute function returns whether or not this script should run. We get the current attack target of the monkey and assign it to target. Then we check if the target is null. If so, we return false. Then we check again if the target is still alive. If not, we return false. Otherwise, we set the local attack target variable to the target and return true to start this AI script. The continue executing function is called every tick and returns whether this script should continue executing. Again, we check if the target is null. If so, we return false. This statement is redundant, but I want to make sure that the script will stop immediately in the event that the target becomes null. Otherwise, we return the should execute function or if the navigation path is clear. In the reset task function, we simply set the local attack target variable to null. This update task function is the main update function for the AI script. It's called every tick that the AI script is executing. First we check that the attack target is not null. Then we check if the monkey is tame. If so, we execute this block. We get the distance between the target and the monkey and a boolean called kenc. The kenc variable will contain whether or not the monkey has a direct line of sight to the target. We get this boolean with the get entity senses kenc function. If the target distance is less than minimum attack distance, we get a random position away from the target then move the monkey to that block at four times his usual movement speed. If the target distance is more than or equal to the max attack distance or the monkey can't see the target, we move the monkey towards the target. Else, we clear the monkey's movement navigation path. This line just sets the monkey's looking direction to face the attack target. Then we increment the counter variable, and if the monkey can see the target and the counter is more than or equal to the max attack time, we call the attack entity with ranged attack in the monkey class and pass the target as the parameter, then set the counter back to zero. The untamed monkey block is very different. In this block, we select a random position away from the attacking entity and move the monkey to that block at 1.5 times his normal movement speed, as long as the target is in range or the monkey can see it. This will make the untamed monkey run away from any entity who attacks him. And we're all done with the AI class for the monkey. You can save and close. Now let's get all the little things out of the way before we move on to the monkey model and render classes. Open the biome gen jungle class in the world biome folder.
At around line 45, insert a new spawnable monster in the list for the monkey entity. The monkey entity also needs to be added to the imports. You can simply hover over it and click the import entity monkey in the pop-up. Then you can save and close. Now open the Entity Spawn Placement Registry class in the Entity folder. Insert an Entity Monkey Spawn Registry in the Registry list. The Entity Monkey class again needs to be added to the imports. Then save and close. Open the Entity List class in the same folder. Scroll down to around line 387 and add this function just before the Entity Egg Info class. This color from RGB is a custom function that converts RGB values to the integer color values that Minecraft uses. We'll use it in a moment to choose colors for the monkey spawn egg. Now add the Entity Monkey class to the Entity Map list just below the Entity Ninja Star class as element number 103, or as the next unused element. The Monkey class also needs to be added to the imports. The parameters for the Add Mapping function are the Entity class, a reference string, the index number, and two integers for the spawn egg colors. We use the color from RGB function we just created to convert RGB to the integer color values because RGB is easier to use. If you open an image editing program like GIMP, Photoshop, or even Windows Paint, you can select a specific color and get the RGB values for that color. A light brown for the first color. And a darker brown for the second color. Then you can save and close. Now it's time to create the model for the monkey. Let's close Eclipse and run Techni. I covered how to create models in my turtle tutorial, so I won't go over it again here. But this is the base model for the monkey. Note that his tail is down. I'll include the Techni files with the download in the description below so you can see the values that were used for each part of the body. The most important thing to keep in mind is to keep the position points for each part in the right place. The position points for each box is also its pivot point. So it's important that all the positions for the head parts have the same position point. The head, nose, and ears must all have the same position point so that they rotate together. And the three tail parts must all have the same position point so that they also rotate together. Best practice is to set the position point and then use the offset to position the box to where it needs to be. I saved out three versions of the monkey's Java code. One for the standing position with the tail at its lowest point, one for the standing position with the tail at its highest point, and one for the sitting position. They'll all be used in the render class to set poses.
For his tail rotation, I subtracted the lowest rotation point angle by the highest rotation point angle and divided the difference by his maximum health. This gave me the angle of rotation for each point of health. For his sitting position, we'll have to move the position points of each part down in the code so that he's sitting on the ground. I'll include the Techni model files, textures, and all assets in the download in the description below. So you can open them up, play around with them, and get a closer look at all the values for each part. So back in Eclipse, right click on the client model folder and create a new class. We call it model monkey. And click finish to create. We start by adding the imports we'll need in this class, and we extend this class from model base. Then we declare model renderer objects for each component in the model and a model sitting boolean to hold whether the monkey is sitting or not. Then we create a constructor. This is where we create the model components and set their default rotation values. At the top, we set the texture width and height to 64 by 32. The tail's default rotations are at the minimum values. Next is the render function. First, we call the parent render function. Then we call the local set rotation angles function, which animates and sets the current rotation of each component. Then we create a condition for if the monkey is a child. If so, we scale the matrix down to half size and render each component. Otherwise, we just render each component as is. This set living animations is used to set different poses. In our case, we set the model sitting boolean to true if the monkey is sitting. Set rotation angles is where we rotate the model components based on the current animation and pose settings. We start off by calling the parent set rotation angles function. First we set the arms and legs swinging rotations for the walking animation. After setting the arms and legs standard animation rotations, we create a conditional statement to check whether the monkey is sitting or not. If the monkey is not sitting, we move all the model components to their normal standing positions. The tail rotation variable contains the value retrieved from the get tail rotation in the entity monkey class. We use it here to set the rotation of the tail components. 
If the monkey is sitting, we move all the components down to where his rear is at the ground level. Then we rotate the leg up 90 degrees and out to the sides 20 degrees into the sitting position. Finally, this block animates the arm swinging motion when the monkey throws a ninja star. The swing progress is a countdown counter variable. When the animation is complete, the counter is set to negative 9,990. So as long as the counter is more than this, we calculate and rotate the arm swinging animation. And that's all for the model class. You can save and close. These are the textures we're going to need. The monkey's base texture. The angry monkey's texture. the monkey's clothing, and the monkey tame texture. The angry and tamed monkey textures need to have the clothing area cut out. We render the monkey with the clothing area transparent, then we render the clothing layer on top of it. And the clothing textures need to be desaturated, which means in gray scale so we can change its color at render time. Let's create the monkey render class. In the client renderer entity folder, create a new class. Call it render monkey and click finish to create. We start by extending this class from the render living class. And we add all the imports we'll need. Next, we need to create three resource location objects for the three monkey body textures. Then a constructor, which simply calls the parent constructor. This obfuscated function is called by the model class to retrieve the tail rotation variable. This get entity texture function returns which texture to use when rendering the monkey. If the monkey is angry, we return the angry monkey texture. If the monkey is tamed but not angry, we return the tamed monkey texture. Otherwise, we return the untamed monkey texture. These six functions are inherited and recast functions all required by the renderer. The inherited do render function all call the first render now function, which is needed to cast the entity to type entity monkey. And that's all for this class. We'll need to come back to this class later to add the clothing layer, but for now you can save and close.
Now it's time for the clothing layer class. A layer is a class that gets added to the render class, and it simply renders the model a second time with a different texture applied. Create a new class in the client renderer entity layer folder. Call it Layer Monkey Clothes and click Finish to create. We don't extend this class, but we do need to implement the Layer Render class. Then we add the imports. We need to create a couple variables, a resource location called clothes texture, which holds the clothing texture, and a render monkey object called render monkey. The constructor for this class, which simply assigns the render monkey instance to the local render monkey object. A should combine textures function that simply returns false. The bind and render function first checks if the monkey is tamed and is not invisible. If so, we then bind the clothing texture to the render monkey instance. These three lines then get the current dye color of the monkey's clothes and applies it to the GL Manager's render color. The last line calls the render monkey class instance render function to render the monkey model again with the clothes texture. This last do render layer is an override of the inherited render function, which calls the bind and render function above. And that's all for the clothing layer. You can save and close. Then reopen the render monkey class in the client renderer entity folder. In the constructor, insert a line after the parent function call. We add a layer using the add layer function for a new layer monkey clothes. The layer monkey clothes class also needs to be added to the imports. Then you can save and close. Finally, we need to add the monkey to the render manager. Open the render manager class in the same folder and scroll down to the end of the constructor around line 205. Just after the NinjaStar registration, we add the monkey to the render registry list. The entity monkey and model monkey classes also need to be added to the imports. Then you can save and close. And we're all done with the monkey coding. One last thing I'd like to do before we move on to setting up the monkey assets. In my last video when we tested the ninja star, I noticed that the ninja star was colliding with water blocks 
as though the water was a solid block. We don't want that. We want the ninja star to slice through water and keep going. So let's fix that now. So let's open the Entity Ninja Star class in the Entity Projectile folder. Scroll down to the On Impact Event function. If we look at the code here, we have a conditional statement for if the Ninja Star hits flowers and bushes and other breakable blocks. but there's no condition for if it collides with water. So it defaults to the solid block collision code, which destroys the ninja star. So let's add another else if conditional statement here for if it collides with a water block. So if the collided block is water, we call the spawn particle function and use the water bubble particle effect. So when the ninja star enters a water block, it will spawn a trail of water bubbles behind it and continue on its path. Then you can save and close Eclipse. Let's get to setting up the assets for the monkey and placing them in the MCP inject folder. Open your MCP inject folder under Assets, Minecraft, Lang, and open the Lang file in Notepad. Here we add an in-game name for the monkey, then save and close. Then go back to the Minecraft root folder, and under the textures folder, create a new folder called Entity. In the Entity folder, create a new folder and call it Monkey. Copy the four monkey textures to the Monkey folder. Before we compile and try it out, there's a little announcement I'd like to make. The 4JPI for Minecraft 1.8 is out. And from now on, I was thinking of making Minecraft modding tutorials with Forge instead of MCP. Uh, Forge is an API built on top of MCP. It allows us to do almost everything we do with MCP, with the slight difference that when we compile the mod, it gets compiled to a self-contained jar file that can be shared with others who have Forge plugin installed. Uh, the Forge plugin adds a mods folder and a menu to Minecraft where you can place all your Forge mods and activate and deactivate them as you please. Uh, you can also create configuration menus for your mods. So let me know what you think in the comments about this change. Um, do you all want me to switch over to making Forge tutorials or should I stay with the hard-coded MCP mods? I think I know what the answer will be, but I wanted to give everyone a chance to express your opinions. So let me know what you think in the comments, Forge or MCP. So let's compile and try out this monkey mod. As usual, you can download the source code and assets for this mod in the description below. And I also included the Techni model files. So if you like this video, please leave a like and share and subscribe for more. So here it is.
Baby monkeys are born tamed, and we forgot to set his health to 100. So let's fix that. In the Entity Monkey class, in the Create Child function, after we set the baby to tamed, we can then insert a set health call and set it to 100. Then save that and recompile.